Today I'd like to share with you uh, a story of the culture shock of, of quiet death. And this is a true story about a Peace Corps worker and some of the challenges that he faced going into another culture. Uh, the real purpose behind this is to illustrate two concepts that I'll write on the board here in a moment, ethnocentrism and cultural relativity. These two concepts are very powerful concepts that you and I can apply in our day-to-day -day lives uh, within our own society, but certainly when we travel to other societies even, even more dramatically, perhaps. If we look at the word ethnocentrism, probably you can break it down pretty fast, this mouthful of words, into two words. And what do you see there? This first part jumps out usually, ethno, and that's like ethnic group or social group. And centrism is like center. So it literally says that I believe my social group is the center or the best. And in fact, uh, the Illini, after which our state of Illinois is named, they were, the Illini meant the real men. And many societies, of course, believed that they were the real men and everybody else was something kind of less. Ethnocentrism is very powerful because it's both functional or useful You'll notice functionalism is a theory in your book, and this is functional related to it. And by functional, what function does it serve? Well, ethnocentrism is the ties that binds. It's the cohesion. It's the glue that pulls people together. It's something neat about feeling positive about the group or the family that I belong to or the school I go to or the place I work or the town I live in or, or the language I speak. It, it's good. So it can be functional, useful, and it can create pride, motivation, group uh, dynamics, great stuff. But it also can be dysfunctional, of course, when we carry it too far. How could it be bad? How could it be bad for a society? Well, if we get too proud of ourselves, you know, pride goeth before the fall, that old statement. If we get too proud of ourselves and our way of doing things, we have trouble understanding that other people can be just different from us, be as good as us, and just be different. Whether it's the food they eat, the language they speak, perhaps the religion that they have, the behavior that they're involved in, it doesn't necessarily mean it's as good as ours, but it just means that it's something we should take a look at and question. So the opposite of ethnocentrism is cultural relativity. And notice this is relative to the culture. And so kind of being the opposite of ethnocentrism, what they're saying here is, let's not just accept anything any culture does. You know, Hitler and lots of Germans prior to Hitler disliked Jews. Is that okay because their culture does it? Is it okay to go to the extreme of trying to kill people off? Well, obviously we've made a moral judgment that that's horrendously wrong. So it's not just accepting anything or that anything goes as it's sometimes portrayed. It's just saying, when you encounter a person behaving differently than yourself, from a subculture of your own society, from another culture, take a deep breath and try to understand why they're behaving that way. Because it might have a functional reason in their context. And that's what this story is about. Let's take a look at the culture shock of quiet death about a Peace Corps worker. about a Peace Corps worker. This young man uh, was very bright, very capable, decided not to go to college. Instead, he went through a very uh, difficult apprenticeship program to be a plumber, to become a master plumber. And in his mid-20s, which is quite unusual, he had become a master plumber. And he decided to take a break from work. And he, he did speak Spanish already, a formal school Spanish, as well as his native English, of course. And he, he wanted to go to the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps was run by the United States. It's a very idealistic sort of organization. And he wanted to go down someplace to a Latin American country where there was Spanish spoken that he could apply his skills as a master plumber and help people out. He went through all the psychological barrier tests, uh, you know, tested out pretty normal. They try to make sure you don't get people that have a lot of problems because you can break in another culture very, very easily. And he passed with flying colors. He's well adjusted, sharp, lots of capabilities, speak Spanish. They'd love to have him. They end up trying to send him down to Ecuador. And so he goes through the training, he learns the local dialect of Spanish, and he goes down to this uh, uh, Ecuador, which is a Christian 
country based in Catholicism, based in a lot of similar things of other Latin American countries. And when he gets there, he uh, is just so excited and he flies down to the large city. He takes a train halfway up this mountain. He takes a bus further up the mountain. And then he's waiting at this bus stop and he's got his leg up on a, on a fence. And he's looking down over this grand mountain range that he's on, on nearly halfway, two thirds of the way up. And he's waiting for a mule train to pick him up to take him to this really remote mountain village. And there he's going to install a sewage system to help cut the death rate. A third to a half of the babies in much of the third world are dead now, this day and age, by the age of five. Something you and I don't experience. As they stand there looking out over this, this valley and the, the fog is kind of wisping up the mountain and he's just, he's just kind of having one of those peak experiences. He's just astounded at the beauty that he's seeing. He hears voices. And he hears voices drifting up this valley. And the voices he hears turns out to be the voices of a sobbing young mother, the gasping for air of her baby son, as it closer gets, it's very apparent the son's in the advanced stages of pneumonia and about to die, or close to death, and the, the baby's father and the baby's uncle. The, the two men are sad and they're passing a flask of whiskey back and forth, and the woman's crying, and they're all three having a conversation should we spend the money to send this baby to the hospital on the bus to try to save its life? He can't believe what he's hearing. His reaction, like yours may be, of course we do whatever we can to try to save our baby. What's wrong? He convinces them to put the baby on the bus with the mother and, and he never finds out what happens. He goes up, he works for two weeks on the top of this mountain, takes his measurements, he's got his transit, so his shooting lines, so the sewage system will drain well and all this good stuff. The village is an, an age-old culture, but they've got open sewage running, you know, with uh, feces and blood and urine, and that's causing disease. So what he's trying to do is to help this group of people out. Two weeks later, he's back at the same spot. He's standing in almost identical place. He's admiring the grand jury. He's really happy with the progress he's making with his work. And he hears voices again. And this time, through the mist, it's another mother, another baby, as it gets closer. It's obvious the baby's lips are turning blue from lack of oxygen. The fingernails are turning blue. The child is in an advanced stage of pneumonia, and guess what? Yes, one more time, the, the father and the mother are discussing whether to, to send this kid on the bus with the mother to try to save its life. And this Peace Corps worker just about goes nuts. He says, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they just see? Obviously, they should save their children. Don't they love their children? In fact, you've probably heard other people say this about some other group of people in the world. They don't seem to love their children like we do. A couple weeks went by, make a long story short, he's back in the same spot, same thing, different family, another baby, more pneumonia. And by this time, he's just exasperated. He can't believe these people are discussing whether to, to spend a small amount of money to send these, these babies, these children, these lovely parts of their future on a bus to save their lives to the hospital. He gets so angry, he can't work with these people. He starts thinking of this, there's something wrong with them. They're not quite human. They're not as good as the way we do things in America. And his emotions are just boiling over. So he goes down and he checks himself into a hotel room for a, literally a month down in one of the big cities of Ecuador and tries to learn more about the culture. And he starts learning why these people, who really, truly do love their children as much as we do, were making such decisions. Can you think of any reasons? Well, to really understand why they might be doing that, some of it would make sense from us just looking at the amount of money they had. Some of it will make sense looking at their religious beliefs. Some of it will make sense looking at uh, their concept of what a kid is like and what an adult is like and, and that whole relationship. So let's take a look at a few of those things. Number one, he got to looking at their literal belief system and their lives were so hard, they're living on $600 a year. They literally define life is hell. Now, they didn't mean that literally, that it was the same as hell, but they meant that life was just tough day in and day out. It wasn't a joy very often for them. Things were so difficult. Number two, they had the literal belief that heaven is real. Now, if life is hell, and heaven is real, and your child dies, and you really believe without a doubt that this kid's going to heaven, death seems a little different. 
This child's going to be in eternity, he's going to be with God, he's going to be walking where everything is easy and life is good and plenty to eat and everything, but he's happy. And so that changes their view. But in addition to that, number three, something related was they have the concept in their religion, which most religions have in some way or another, of the age of consent. And what that means is, there's a certain age if you do something that's bad before that, you know, you're just kind of forgiven because you're a kid and you don't know any better. But if you make a major error and you commit uh, carnal sins above a certain age, many people believe that you may not be forgiven for that. And if you die, you might go to hell. Now let's look at this specifically. If you're baptized in their belief system and you die before the age of consent, where are you going? You're going to spend eternity in heaven. You're guaranteed that by their belief system. Now notice you may not believe that. I may believe it or I may not believe it. But in sociology, what's important in our study is beliefs, whether they're true or false, impact the behavior of people. All right, now let's say they go out of their way and they save this kid's life, and they uh, get this kid to be age 15, and the kid uh, then does some horrible thing and gets killed. That kid runs the risk of spending eternity where? In the fires of hell by their belief system. Number four, uh, money to their other kids. Now we often make fun of people in third world countries, particularly farming communities where they still have large families, and we'll say, well, my God, don't they understand if they just had a few kids that they'd be better off? In reality, that's not true. They didn't have social security to take care of them when they're old. Who takes care of them when they're old? Kids that have grown up and been good kids. They don't have lots of other support system. Who takes care of them? It's their own family. And if you're a farmer, you need a large number of kids for what reason? Work in the farm. One is they plant in the spring, and two is they harvest in the fall. In fact, that's how we got our school year based the way it is. So kids really are an economic asset in a farming community. Now, if they have so little money coming in a year, and they spend what little money they've got, let's say it's 15 bucks out of 600 for the year. It's only 15 bucks for that bus ride. What's that do? 15 bucks is a huge amount of money, and what that does is take money out of the mouths of their other children. What happens if your other children don't have enough to eat? Let's say you've got six or seven other kids. Their immune systems get compromised, they get malnourished, and they're more likely to get sick and die. So by saving one child, you may be putting other children at risk because you've taken money out of their mouths. And then finally, in the third world, medicine is often so bad compared to what we experience, and it's often that the people wait till the last moment, that the people are already ready to die when they get to the hospital anyway, that in many cultures, and it was true in this particular culture, is that the hospital in the local language is literally the place you go to die. So they don't have a lot of confidence in medicine. All right, now we've set the stage. We've laid out the story, here's what's going on. It doesn't mean that what they're doing is right or good or that he should even change his opinion. All it says is that he now has some basis from which to realize, my God, these are really good people. They have a very different world experience than, they, than I have ever had and they view the world differently than I do, now I can understand why they might have the decision, discussion of whether to make that decision to send the kid to the hospital or not. Okay, let's apply the concept of ethnocentrism. When was he being ethnocentric in this study? Well, when he's getting all emotional, he's saying, my God, they don't love their kids, they're not as good as I am, they don't behave like Americans, they're just not right. That's ethnocentric behavior. When was he being culturally relative and what did it mean? Well, when he figured these things out, life is hell, heaven is real, left an in off here, sorry. Heaven is real, the age of consent, dollars out of the mouths of the other children, and the hospital's the place you go to die. When he started figuring those things out, he still never got comfortable. He still never felt it was right what they were doing, but what he was able to see was there are cultural reasons they were behaving the way they behaved. That's cultural relativity and it helped him uh, feel better about it, go back to the situation, maintain his ethical and moral values, and still work to help these people, and learn to realize they were just as good a people as he is.